Okay. Okay, here is the figure I was looking for. It's the Muller liar illusion, right? Okay, you see this picture? With the lines? Yeah. 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 Do you want to draw them? They have to be exactly the same length. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you see that, right? Yeah, we can see Yeah. This is, the lines are exactly the same length, and yet they always appear to be of different length. They're not the same length. Yes, they are exactly. <laughs> yes, they are exactly. These lines are different lengths to those lines. No, no, the, this, <laughs> this line here, the horizontal line of the, okay, okay. So, the horizontal line, thank you for the precision, is exactly the same. And yet, when you look at them, it looks like this is a lot, this line is longer than that line, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, that sh you should like that, because that's similar to Gestalt, oh, right? Gestalt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the idea that uh, and and, we, and we, even when we know they are of the same length, we still see them differently, right? So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that <coughs> in our experience, what is given to us is given as a function of the whole. So when we look at these two lines, we wish we could isolate them, but as long as we see... The only way we could do that is we would have to cut completely the non-horizontal lines, right? As long as we see these two, the non-horizontal lines, we cannot but see these lines as being of different length, right? Yeah. And that's why, well, that's what Prabhupandit was talking in his talk uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, is the idea that consciousness, <laughs> that what is given in consciousness is not different elements which exist, comes to us kind of separately, but rather that consciousness makes sense of a whole situation and that each object is stands in relation to this whole. So that's why, for example, in Gestalt uh, uh, philosophy, psychology, uh, they always talk a lot more than in phenomenology, but it's basically very similar tradition, how we see object against the background, right? And that's the indication that when we see something, we don't see different elements separately, rather we see a whole thing, right? Can I, George, that Can sounds I make an like example? the same thing? Yes, please. So that's an example, because what you see is a chair, not four pipes, a back and a base. You see one chair. So that's the perspective you're... You, yes. Before, you, you don't see the chair then computed. The, the scene comes in, it gets computed, and then it's presented to consciousness as a complete object. Yeah, I wouldn't use the word computed, but yeah, that's exactly right. And notice that this also involves learning, right? Because before you learned what a chair is for, you, didn't, you don't know, you don't see it in the same way. Once you have learned it, then you see uh, gestalt, use the word gestalt, right? Which means a form, a figure. Yes? But that sounds a lot like the intentionality because you yes. it's a question of making sense of yes. what you're seeing. Yes, exactly. And you're right. Remember, the main feature is, for Husserl, intentionality. Okay. Yes. But I mention that because uh, that's an important feature of consciousness understood in this perspective, right? That it's holistic. And that's why 
uh, there is really strong, that's why people who hold this view will have a strong suspicion that computationalism might not be able to explain consciousness because it's not clear how you go from the processing of information one by one to this whole view, right? To this whole experience as a whole, right? Now, does it start as information processing? Probably most likely, right? If we look at uh, what's happening in vision, it, it extremely likely starts as information processing. But as it gets, information gets integrated, it gets integrated to, into a whole, and that's what our uh, uh, conscious, that's what consciousness is, or that's why our experience is, right? And so the challenge uh, to explain consciousness is precisely how you go from the, if you want to say, mechanistic basis uh, of cognition to this integrated whole, which is our experience. And the people who, like myself, who don't hold a computationalist view think that you cannot do it for computation, that it will have to be different mechanism having to do with how neurons and the brain works. Now, people who hold this computational view think, no, it's just, if it's complicated enough, we can do it. Okay, these are two hypotheses, and I have a view, but obviously the question is on the table, and obviously we don't know. Yes? So this, the, <clears throat> the integration you're speaking of, it's, it can be pre-reflected, pre-verbal, because say I come from yes. a tribe that doesn't have seats. Yes. And it picks up something. Yes. I know it's a thing he's picking up. I don't know it's a seat. I exactly. It's a common I see it's it could be. Yeah. It could be a weapon, yeah. yeah. But yes. I, even before I start to think about it, I see one. Absolutely. Yeah. This is why we want to emphasize, to repeat myself, that we should never equate consciousness with thinking, right? Consciousness starts at the reflective level, and obviously thinking is important, but we want to move away from this kind of Cartesian idea, which basically holds that consciousness is whatever I think about, right? No. Uh, consciousness is not limited to that, and uh, include this pre-reflective level. This is where Dennett and phenomenology really part away radically because Dennett thinks it doesn't make any sense to try to think about experience pre-reflectively. All what we have is the story that we tell. No, I don't agree. I think there is such thing as experience. And for example, the experience of pain is a good example of a very raw level of experience, which to me, I cannot even imagine how you can explain it uh, otherwise but at the pre-reflective level. Yes? Yeah, I'm thinking about how this relates to Buddhism or any kind of religious or philosophical belief, because in a larger sense, we're trying to make sense of our entire life, in a larger sense, we're trying to make sense of the world and our experience mm -hmm. in it. But I'm thinking that this is like a component of that. I remember Philip Roth novel where he ends the novel talking about how the him telling stories, whether it's true stories from our experience or made up stories, yeah. telling stories is a way in which we understand our lives, our experience mm -hmm. in the world. In fact, I think it's the most basic component of all human experience is telling stories. And no, I would not say it's the most basic, but it's one level of one makes, level. making sense. I think the most basic is what starts maybe before birth, in which you're trying to make sense of the, what is around you, the people you're relating to, and so on. That's probably the most basic. Yeah. yeah. yeah but also in a larger sense, we use Buddhism or any religion as another way to make sense of our experiences. We got pain, we age, we get sick, and so on. How do we understand and make sense of this experience of being in this world? Okay, that's 
making sense of things in this way is interpreted, right? But there is a pre-reflective level in which we make sense of it non, in a non-interpretive way, right? Non-cognitive. Oh, no, it's cognitive. For example, okay, pain. Three components. Sensory component, intensity, location, and so on. Uh, affective component, pleasant, unpleasant, in this case unpleasant, right? Uh, cognitive component, how I make sense, of, how I interpret it, right? So the, the, the making sense starts already at the second level, right? In which I think shitty, right? Because I am in pain, right? And then after that I tell myself a story or interpret that, I try to understand what's happening and so on. So uh, uh, sense-making is at several levels, right? There is one high level which is conceptual, reflective, and there is a lower level which is more basic, which I would call pre-reflective, right? Okay? Okay. Yes? I just was remembering you saying the way you taught this course was in, in, together with a cognitive scientist. And yes. In the teaching of the course, did he stand up for computational? Yes. Work? And so you must have had a considerable debate through the whole course. This is why I started... You're giving us the winning side, right? Well, I give my side. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we have four, four, four or five sessions, not 12. But yeah, yeah, I give my side. I, but I, I make it clear that there is this view here, right? It's just pain is a great example for my view, for this view. For two reasons. One, it's a raw sensation which is very hard to kind of interpret away, right? Second is that it also reflects an important, another putative candidate for invariant, which is ownership. By the way, we have about 20 minutes. And then yeah, a bit. The question. Okay, probably a bit more, but we are nearing the end. Did you say ownership? Ownership. And maybe put in parentheses, perspectival ownership. Perspectival, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay, ownership. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it's a bit of an unfortunate term because it suggests that there is an owner to consciousness which would be separate from consciousness. That's obviously not what is meant here. What is meant here is perspectival ownership, meaning the fact that consciousness is always for a subject. It's for me. So consciousness is not a set of input that are given uh, impersonally but it's always happening to somebody, for somebody, for an organism. Remember what I talked about phenomenal consciousness? I talked about how is it for the organism that is undergoing the experience. That's ownership, the fact that there is a for somebody. Okay? <laughs> So, consciousness is not given impersonally, but is given to or for somebody. Meaning, there are two poles to consciousness. One is the objective pole, but there is also the subjective pole that is the subject who is undergoing the experience. Right? That subject, if you, or if another way to put it is that any consciousness come with a sense of I-ness. I 
am the one who is talking to you, seeing you, and so on. Every state of consciousness, at least as a putative candidate, because maybe we would say, maybe it's true or not true, and we can talk about that in deeper meditative experience, whether that sense of I-ness remains or not. But for most normal experiences, there is always an I who is a reference to for whom everything is going on, right? In the field of experience. That's a very important feature of consciousness. Hence, uh, phenomenologists and on that they all agree, talk about consciousness as having, being a form of pre-reflective self-awareness. Can you write this? Yes. Is that number four or part of No, it's, it's an explanation of this. Pre-reflective is... Self-awareness. No. No. And I will talk more about it because obviously you think, well, what about self and no self? I will talk about this next time. Pre-reflective what? Self-awareness. So there is going to be the debate, does this mean there is a self or not? And we'll talk about this next time because there is a lot to be said about that. So what confuses me here is uh, the, the full meanness of yes. the experience is a fundamental aspect of consciousness. Yes. Does that mean that to have a, to honest, to have a pre-reflective awareness of that things are for me means that there are all of that? that this object can also be for other people as well. I mean, is there a pre-reflective, intersubjective field? Yes. Okay. Yes. It just means that for every experience I have, there is a subjective side and there is an object side. Right. But does that mean I'm pre-reflectively understand that other people have different perspectives? That's probably reflective. That's what I don't understand. Like, how can you have it for me? without understanding that it's for others? Well, uh, obviously we are here, we have a linguistic problem, right? Because we have to use words for an experience which probably predates language. Now, this is controversial because we'll talk more about the self and some people argue that the self that the I arise only in reference or in contradistinction to the other or the you, right? Which from a linguistic point of view is, is clear. What I would argue is that there is a much pre-reflective level of self-awareness that is prior to any kind of uh, you, me, and so on. And this is what I call I next. Now, let me go to quickly, because we are running out of time, to where we find this consciousness, the best example of this consciousness. Because you think, you may think, well, consciousness is something kind of woozy and supramundane and so on. Reality couldn't be more different than that. The best place to find what consciousness looks like is in the body. And that's a work of Merleau-Ponty. Merleau-Ponty thinks about the body in terms of two, two aspects of the body, the objective body and the lived body. What's a lived body? The lived body is a body as I experience it from the inside, okay? That's a form of consciousness. That's actually the best way to understand consciousness. Propio, what we call proprioceptive awareness, which is the awareness that I have of my body from the inside. <laughs> you may think, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> because I'm not talking about touch. When we touch something, we have a sense of, yeah, of an object and so on. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the awareness that we have in our body 
of our body, which we have to various degree, but more or less constantly, at least when we are in the waking, awakened state, right? Meaning there is a form of awareness that I have of my body, which is not when I think about my body, but which allows me to move around in the world. There is a very unfortunate person who is called Yen Waterman. And Yen Waterman had a stroke, and in his stroke, he lost the ability to have proprioceptive awareness from the eyes downward. So he can feel himself to be here, but he doesn't feel to be all the way down. Okay. Just to be clear, he can feel, he just can't feel where his body is. In exactly, his body. exactly. He has feelings. If you hit his hand, he will pull it back, but he has no sense of where his body is. So how does he work, function in the world? Like this. He has to look at where he walks, because he doesn't know where his feet are. His feet are, right? He has no idea. That's proprioceptive awareness, and this very unfortunate person lacks this proprioceptive awareness. Why it's so interesting? Because we see that here we have a, a form of consciousness which is embodied, which covers the whole of our body, and which has an element of self-awareness. And yet it's not the case that we constantly look at our body, constantly feel of our body inside. Rather, we immediately know. It's in our consciousness, we know where our body is. Not all the time. Sometimes we are so engrossed into an experience that we may lose track of that. But Okay, we'll not talk about that. We're supposed to be good Buddhists here. <laughs> so that's, an, that's the best example of how to think about consciousness. Not as this kind of, uh, kind of discrete cognitive event, but rather as a way in which we make sense of experience as a whole, and part of making sense of experience is how we make we uh, uh, make sense of where our body is. So consciousness entails two things. We go back now to Buddhist Dignaga and Dharmakirti in the fifth and seventh century. Dignaga said consciousness has two aspects. One aspect is sensing, right? The other aspect is self-awareness, right? That's the two aspects of consciousness that uh, we uh, need to keep, keep in mind. And from a Buddhist perspective, I would say this self-consciousness is extremely important and maybe is more primitive than uh, intentionality itself. Maybe, maybe not. But certainly it's a very important aspect of consciousness. That consciousness <laughs> comes very clearly in feelings, right? One of the important aspects of uh, Buddhist idea about the mind is the primacy of sensation, of feelings, Vedana. Uh, like, it's not feelings like emotions. Yeah. By Vedana, what is mean is the feeling tone, the hedonic tone of every experience, right? Liking or disliking? Pleasant and pleasant, yeah. Liking, disliking is the reaction to Vedana, right? But. Vedana is pleasant and pleasant neutral, right? And in the Buddhist way of thinking about the mind, this is one of the earliest cognitive factors. So we have citta, and probably the first mental factors that go with citta is Vedana, right? 
hedonic tone, feeling, sensation in the sense of sensing pleasant and pleasant. Now, Dharmakirti, not Dipnaga, but Dharmakirti argues, and I think there is a lot to be said for that, that the fact that we have uh, this Vedana, this sense, feel, what the word you use? Feelings or sensation? You use feeling, but yeah. it's something yeah. it's not emotions. No, this is the hedonic tone, right? <coughs> Uh, that the fact that we have feeling hedonic tone in our experience shows the self-aware nature of consciousness because when we have this uh, experience we ips, eo ipso, we by the very fact know how it feels. Now it may feel neutral and we don't feel anything so it doesn't matter. But if it feels pleasant or unpleasant, we immediately know, right? It's not like we need to think about that. No. Part of the experience, the experience itself, is this feeling, this hedonic tone, right? And Dharma Kirti argues that shows that consciousness is not just intentional, but it has also this self-aware aspect. So, Consciousness in this way of thinking is a way of making sense of the world in reference to oneself and particularly to one's feelings, right? That's um, one of the main ways we have to make sense of the world, is how it feels, right? Yeah, to, to the organism. Yeah, how the organism feel about the experience. So there is the sensing, there is the perception of the world, and then there is this factor of self-awareness, which informs us immediately how it feels. Good, not good. And that, you can plug in a whole lot of things about Buddhism, because that's where attachment, aversion starts, karma, and so on, everything starts from there. Right? Oops. Yes. We're only talking about waking consciousness as a form of consciousness. Uh, we did that last week. You weren't here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Consciousness. Uh, yeah. There is waking, but there is dream state. There is hypnosis. Or mal. Yes. Yes. There are all kind of yes. And, and to which extent these putative candidates uh, are in that level of experience or not, that's a question. For example, I would argue that in deep sleep, from a yogic perspective, right, often in deep sleep there is consciousness, and maybe the only consciousness there is is this self, pre-reflective self-awareness. That's the only thing that is in consciousness, arguably, there is no real intentionality there, right? So yeah, this is also why I call them putative candidates for invariant features of experience. Yeah, but dream, we have intentionality in dreams too, right? Because we are making sense of, as we go, it doesn't make sense after, but uh, in the dream itself, we are afraid, right? These candidates, one, two, three. One, two, three, yeah. Are they usually exclusive? No. Are they collective? You need to have all of them in order to... Putatively. Putatively, <laughs> exactly. Right, okay. Okay, so, so, they, so it's, that would be, if you had all three together, you would have the... Well, that's our awakened experience, okay. right? I would say dream experience, we probably have all three, and then we can go down, 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 and then obviously talk about dreamless consciousness in dreamless sleep is still pretty uh, controversial. Uh, con talking about consciousness in dream is starting to become standard. You would not believe that a few years ago everybody would talk about consciousness. When I wake up, right, as if consciousness did not exist when I am sleeping, 
So in dream, people are starting to realize that there is consciousness. And for example, experiences of lucid dreaming is starting to become a little bit more mainstream. Uh, dreamless ex consciousness in dreamless sleep, that's still debatable. That's, people write about that. And uh, I personally think there is consciousness because there is a sense of time. When I wake up, I have a sense of time. Whereas when I wake up from uh, anesthesia, as far as I remember, I don't have a sense of time, right? It's just as if I had been put to sleep immediately. Whereas when I wake up from a sleepless dream, from a, dream, from a sorry, dreamless sleep, uh, I do have, I think I have a sense of time. So I would think that this indicates something like an experience, right? But yeah, that's still pretty on the fringe. And in deep meditation, the same. You know, there's a sense of time. Uh... Well, it's interesting because they say that when you're in real deep meditation, you can wake up exactly at the right moment. I don't know, I'm not at that, so I have no, uh, I would totally defer to people who have this kind of meditative abilities. Okay. Yes? Uh, we're, we're only, so three is the total. Uh, yes. Okay. So we're now going to go 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. We have a bit more. Yeah, okay. 12 but. 12 minutes for questions. <laughs> <laughs> there might be no question. Yes. These are. Um, these three things, these PCIEs, are they what Husserl said? You can find them in Husserl, yeah. Remember, what we are doing here is like Husserl for the masses, right? right. Because, <laughs> but it goes back to yeah, yes, it absolutely goes back to Husserl. I don't know if the term ownership itself goes back to Husserl or not. I'm not sure, but, right. but uh, all this is. Pre-reflective self-awareness, holism, all this goes back to Husserl. So the, the third one, ownership, this is really about embodied personhood? No, it's about self-awareness. For Husserl, for all the phenomenologists, and for uh, Buddhists like Dharmakirti and all the figures who follow him, awareness or consciousness always entails self Consciousness. Self as an embodied here. Well, that is disputable. But by self consciousness here is mean not consciousness of the self, but simply awareness that this is happening to me. To, For, to, the, subject. to the subject. For example, when you have an experience, you don't need to think this is happening to me. It is happening to you, to you, and you know that. Now, you may be totally deluded about what's happening to you, right? What is happening? But the to you is clear, is clear and is immune from misidentification. That's a really interesting. You can never be wrong about that. <laughs> At least I have never heard. Of. For example, there are cases in which uh, you can create it, all kind of perceptual illusion, like the, the rubber hand, right? Uh, there is an experiment in which you, you, they, they strike your hand in various ways, and uh, then they strike uh, your, a rubber hand, which is next to, to you, and through complicated senses, you start to feel when they strike the ru rubber hand. And then at the end of the experiment, they bring the hammer and they smash the hand and you scream. <laughs> now, you're mistaken about what's happening to you, but that is happening to you. You're not mistaken. So the to you is what they say in some phenomenological discussion is immune to misidentification. For example, when you identify yourself, you can be mistaken. For example, I look in, in the mirror and I see the old guy and I say, this is not me. <laughs> I am 35 years old, this cannot be me. Right? This is not immune to misidentification because that's 
an identification through of myself as an object, right? Here, what we are talking is identification as a subject, right? The fact that you, it's always to you that is happening. Yes? Uh, could you say a little bit about what, in your view, uh, are the consequences of holding the gatekeeper model or the phenomenological model? Uh, in terms of, well, one of the consequences I talked about is that if you hold the gatekeeper view, uh, I think you have a hard time explaining, uh, for example, the rich uh, phenomenology of our visual perception. Because, now, you may, you may think, yeah, okay, but in fact the brain is processing a pretty narrow range of sensation. Yes, it's true. This is really what I see clearly is actually pretty small. But then I have a sense of the room and, and so on. Now you could say maybe it's mistaken, okay, but it is there as an appearance. It's given to me in experience. That's why I think the gatekeeper view is not a very good view because it really has a trouble to account for the richness of our experience because everything becomes sliced in small pieces and you don't have a way to explain this holistic feature of consciousness which is what we experience I think so what we were doing today is trying to get some handle on some of the features of our experience, right? And I think that if we're right in the description, then this view is going to have a hard time to account for some of the features, particularly in this case, the perspectival or holistic feature of consciousness. That would be one of the consequences or one of the ways the two views differ, right? Yeah? The uh, temporal aspects of consciousness. Yeah. No, that's next time. Next time is <laughs> the temporal aspect of consciousness and the self. But it's not a putative candidate? Uh, it's different. Okay. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Lecture with, with somebody else who's more on the gatekeeper model. Yes. Uh, just in terms of what you were saying of how the gatekeeper model would have difficulty dealing with yes. the, uh, the holism and so on. What's the what's the converse argument that your 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 colleague would have would have said in refute of what you just said? Well I would not tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the problem, I, I don't think you, well, I mean, this is why I use the word putative in a way, because how sure are we that these uh, features are there or not, okay? This is one set of questions we can raise. Uh, but I think in general, uh, the people who hold this view or related view, like Dan, Daniel Dennett, have a hard time explaining certain experiences. And this is where, in general, I push my case. And my friend, actually, I don't really know what he thinks. But... Uh, you know, he's explaining, he's, he does cognitive science, so he's explaining the point of view. But uh, this is why I, I emphasize in my class and here the importance of the pre-reflective level, because as soon as you move to the reflective, then it's extremely easy for the gatekeeper view to go through, because we have excellent way to think about thinking in terms of language and so on, right? So as soon as you go to the, the, the reflective level, the task of the gatekeeper becomes uh, easier. This is why in, 
in my course, I always emphasize that we pay attention to consciousness at the pre-reflective level, because this is where it starts. Obviously, there is a whole reflective level, which is hugely important and so on, but we want to pay special attention to the pre-reflective level in order to get us out of this view that to be conscious is, or consciousness is what we think about, right? And I think to people who meditate, hopefully this makes sense. This is why I make my students meditate in that class, and that opens them, them to a whole different level, a much more basic level of experience, get them out of the head and get them to look at breath and so on. It's not just an easy way to use up half an hour of your class time. <laughs> no, it's a short moment. <laughs> it, is, it might be in the next class I teach, but that's another, not for here. Mm -hmm. Yes? What does that mean if it gives the, the gate even more than the um, phenomenal field model? <coughs> and I guess in the gate, the I, the sense of the I would attach itself to attention. And in the phenomenal field model, yeah. the sense of I attaches itself to consciousness. Yes. Yeah. But in, the, in this model, in a way, you, you can easily plug in an idea that the I is only a conceptual construction. Well, in this view, this is why it has interesting consequence for the question of self. In this view, the I, in a certain sense of the word, right, is intrinsic to consciousness. In that view, it doesn't need to be. So this is why people like Daniel Dennett and so on will favor view like that, and they will say, no, the I is just a narrative, an effect of narrativity. It's a conceptual construction. I, in this view, the I is seen as an intrinsic feature of experience. Now, does that mean there is a self or not? We'll talk about it next time. Phenomenologists are sharply divided on that, Husserl talks about transcendental ego. Merleau-Ponty doesn't talk about the self. Sartre, in his early book, uh, The Transcendence of the Ego, talks about pretty much a Buddhist model of consciousness. He doesn't know that it's a Buddhist model, but it's pretty much Dharma Kirti idea of consciousness. So there is no self. And then later, in uh, his later book, L'être uh, et le what being and nothingness, he comes back to an idea that there is a self. So phenomenologists are, are very divided about that, and this all comes from this idea that this I is an intrinsic feature of uh, consciousness. And this is the second topic I want to talk about next time after talking about time consciousness. Okay. One more? Yes? Could you quickly define transcendental? Uh, yes. Condition of the possibility. So a transcendental analysis is always looking for the condition of the possibility of an experience. Now this is using the word transcendental in a Kantian sense, which is what Husserl does. So when he talks about transcendental, it means condition of the possibility. So for example, it would be condition of the possibility of experience, right? Thank you. Okay. okay. I think that's it. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs>